Well, we return tonight to our study of anthropology, which is the study of man. Uh, This is message number seven in our series, and I do plan to move on with the study toward what some have called gendered piety, or what it means to be a godly man and a godly woman. And we'll look to discuss those two genders. Unfortunately, we won't have time to discuss all the other genders um, that have been recently discovered. And and so we'll just focus on the only two genders identified in the Bible. Uh, We'll then look at what God has designed for marriage when two become one. And we'll talk about parenting when that union produces fruit so that hopefully the fruit of the marriage doesn't turn out to be rotten. But tonight, I want to pick up from where I left off last week. We've been talking about the makeup of man. And and actually, before we do that, I do want to take a quick aside. I forgot I was going to take a quick aside uh, for for two things. Um, First, I I do want to let you know that our our podcast is going to um, drop our second episode tomorrow. And so looking forward to uh, sharing our distinctives as a church with all of you. Uh, going through those a little bit more in depth, and so we're looking forward to you being able to interact with us in that way. But I also wanted to take a quick aside. Also, uh, I meant to do this a few minutes ago, so I apologize, Uh, but I want to go ahead and stop here before we get too far into the message. Uh, I just wanted to take a minute to address, as many of you probably are aware, um, of the so-called Asbury University uh, revival. And um, uh, it would be, make a great podcast episode. I wish we would have actually been able to do that, but, we, uh, but if we recorded it, uh, we'd be really probably late to the party, and uh, it would be released a few weeks uh, probably too late. And so I just want to take a few minutes to just address a couple of the things here. Um, right now, there's a lot of question, uh, is this legitimate? There's a lot of worry and concern about coming out and saying, you know, I, I'm skeptical or I don't believe it or whatever. I'm just going to say it has virtually no consequential uh, value in it at this point from anything that I'm able to see. You'll also uh, note that the Asbury University uh, has semi-routine revivals every so often in the months of February and March. This is revival number, I don't know, I think it's something like nine, ten, over the last hundred years. Um, And they're all in February and March, so, uh, so spontaneous, I'm not so sure of. Uh, additionally, there's other elements in terms of when we're talking about um, so-called movements of the Spirit of God and revival or awakenings, uh, generally the ones that we care about are going to be those that are, uh, are filled with, with serious preaching and heavy doses of, the, of preaching on sin. Where there is no preaching on sin, uh, Again, grace does not abound. Uh, revival doesn't take place, ultimately, because we're deal- you, if you want a revival, you need to deal in, you're dealing in the business of repentance. And, and you're dealing with, with conversion. And, and so revivals and awakenings are really born out of, out of serious uh, preaching that preaches the doctrine of sin especially. And as people come under the conviction of sin, then there is repentance. And you can have believers, of course, repenting, because that's what believers do when confronted with our sin, right? Believers are repenters. That's one of our favorite phrases around here. Believers are repenters. Uh, but what we have just generally from what, uh, just observa- some of the observations, some of the things I've, I've seen and, and heard also, um, is, is, is just a lot of emotionalism that is catching a lot of social media fire, and then people are glumming on and wanting to be seen to be a part of something like that. Um, And I'm not saying that, again, I I have heard some people talk about how, well, every revival is mixed. Even Jesus, when he was on earth, I mean, he had Judas with him, and and there's lots of people that heard Jesus, and of course, they didn't didn't really truly follow him or didn't follow him very long. They were temporary. And so I I do get that. That's not what what I'm saying, but it's, it's not something to get particularly worked up about. And most of those things are viewed in hindsight from the perspective of history, looking back to see something great that God has done and moved and moved in. Um, so I'm not saying that, that God can't be in there in certain areas and that certain people are, are having a, a change of heart. That's ultimately for God to, uh, to determine. Um, but I think really what you have primarily is, is a situation of 
of emotionalism, of charismatic um, excitement. Um, but I've not seen anything that, uh, that certainly says that our nation is, is on the right track of repentance um, and, and a newness and walk and seriousness um, in the way in which we take God. And so I just wanted to just speak to that just briefly. Uh, it's just nothing to get super excited about at this point. And, and I will just take a quick moment and say, uh, I have no problem uh, looking for, we, we pray for, right? We pray for fairly often for God to move among us and by way of, of awakening and revival, uh, reformation. Those types of things are good. Those are real things. Those are good things. And, and those are things we would not want to, uh, to shun or to be so stuffy that we would never acknowledge that. Um, but just from the per- perspective of your pastor, uh, what I see from the Asbury revival um, isn't, isn't much of anything. It's a blip on the uh, Asbury radar. But that's so far all I've been able to see. And we'll see what the Lord might do and take from that. Um, but we want to be serious ourselves. And it's a good opportunity to take, take note, take stock of ourselves and, uh, and consider um, our, walk with, our walk with the Lord individually and personally. And, uh, and we'll look for, for God to sanctify His people and to bring the lost to Himself. And that's really what, we, what we're looking for. All right, so that was free. No, no extra charge on that one. So let me just get back to our study tonight. Uh, as I started off, we have been talking about, the, uh, about anthropology. We've been talking specifically about the makeup of man. So what are we? And there's a lot of issues today, of course, and what is a man and what is a woman? Well, we're looking at what is a, really a human being. What, what is man created in the image of God? designed to take dominion of the world as stewards of God. This is God's world, and He made us as the pinnacle of creation. God has breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so we've looked at how man is made in God's image with a material body and an immaterial soul combined in a complex unity. And I've extended out that study a bit further to discuss some of the errors in thinking, the the heresies of men that have huge implications for how we live and how we think about our relationship to God in the world that He has made. And so we've talked about recently the heresy of Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a formal Christian heresy in the first and second centuries that was rooted in Greek dualistic philosophy. Now, by way of reminder, dualism is simply the division of thought into two categories, and a dualistic philosophy develops ideas that flow into practical living underneath those two categories. And so, for Gnostic thinking, the two categories that are divided or are separated are the physical versus the spiritual. The physical world, matter, The fleshly body is seen as inferior to the point of being associated with evil. Physical equals bad. But the spiritual, the non-material realm, was seen as ideal and associated with good. And so the goal of Gnosticism was to transcend the physical, the ordinary, the bodily appetites, the needs, and the passions, and to attain to the secret spiritual knowledge. The physical world and the body, that which is seen, is ordinary and mundane. And so the goal was to transcend the physical, seeing the way of suffering as the preferable means by which the individual transcends the earthly and attains spiritual enlightenment by way of secret spiritual knowledge. But they also had another path to that. That's one way. The other way the Gnostics would go would be to transcend the physical by indulging the flesh. That was the most convenient one. Since the body was inherently evil or less than to the point of not mattering, So they would use then the body for immoral pleasures since it didn't matter or pertain to the spiritual. 
And so since the spiritual realm was separated from the physical and they could, and they could not touch then the physical and the spiritual, you could then do with the body whatever you wanted. And that dualism had very relevant implications for theology. And it was the response of the apostles who confronted this error personally and head on because Gnosticism, listen, is an affront to the person of Christ. This was no benign way of thinking. This, this was not something that was, you know, just wrong. It was dangerous. Gnostic teaching concluded once again, it went one of two ways when it came to theology. It either went the route that denied Jesus was God because Jesus was a man. And so since Jesus had a physical body, the divine spirit could not be tainted by the corruptions of evil flesh. Could not take on a human physical body. But yet we know that that view of Christ is heresy. Jesus is God. And man. But the other side of the Gnostic coin was to acknowledge the deity of Christ, but to deny that He was truly man. They would try to say that Jesus only appeared to be a man, but because we know that the divine cannot be touched by the earthly, the physical, then He must have only appeared to be a man, but was not actually God in, or was, God, was actually not actually God in flesh. He just appeared to be a man. He was God, though. And so the apostles John and Paul primarily confronted this heresy head on. And so we noted also that this Gnostic dualism, which was the search for secret and hidden spiritual knowledge, was not invented in the first century. We spent some time looking at the temptation by Satan of Eve in the garden. The way the devil tempted Eve was to suggest that God had actually hidden from her the true knowledge that was behind the physical fruit. If she would break the commandment and indulge the flesh, for it was pleasing to the eye and good for food, then she would be enlightened. She would attain the spiritual knowledge of good and evil, and she would be like God. And so this dualism of separating the body and the spirit, separating the ordinary world of matter that God has made and is active in by His Spirit, this error is as old as the original temptation. And what we've talked about most recently is the dualism that has seeped into Christian churches by way of practice and emphasis. It doesn't, listen, it doesn't show up in any doctrinal statement. And you're going to hear about this a little bit in the podcast. So I'll just leave it at that. I won't redo the podcast now, so you have to listen to it. But it shows up in practice and emphasis. Okay, that's how it shows up. When you, you go to a church's website and you go to their doctrinal statement, you won't find, we teach Gnosticism. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It shows up in places like worship, especially in their style and use of music, because the goal for them in, of worship is to experience, experience something beyond the ordinary. The goal of worship is a spiritual experience where you engage with the Holy Spirit, where you feel something beyond the ordinary everyday life. There is really a sense of desire for escape. And it also shows up in teaching and practice of the Christian life where the secular and the sacred and the, or the ordinary and the spiritual are separated. This is another practical way it shows up in Christian churches. Because the spiritual is good, and the ordinary or the secular, meaning the life outside of the Christian church industry, that ranges from mostly meaningless to bad. The things that really matter are the things associated with the church. 
the first class A grade Christian is the pastor or the missionary. Etc. And, and the rest of life is only valuable insofar as it supports or finances those endeavors. Now, the ordinary is not spoken about then as having spiritual value. But what we pointed out is that everything in this ordinary physical life, and I'll just shorten it, everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. But what we've pointed out is, is that everything in this ordinary physical life has spiritual relevance. Man was made as a complex unity, not division, but, un, but a unity of body and soul. And so listen, how we treat our bodies matters spiritually. Spiritually. Not only did God in Christ take on human flesh, but the Holy Spirit of God has united Himself to believers so that Paul says our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's amazing and remarkable, isn't it? God dwells in us. He is ever-present in you, right now, all the time, awake or asleep, no difference. But guess what? You don't feel Him right now, do you? You're just sitting in a chair, thoughtful, somewhat ordinary. Kelly's trying to feel Him, but he, he's, he's not succeeding. There, there is something so ordinary, and yet Scripture affirms and teaches that we are engaged in our daily lives in a spiritual war. Did you know that you're in a spiritual battle right now? Well, how do I fight this battle? Where's the front line? You fight it in the body. And you fight it every day. And you do so with ordinary means and through ordinary life, and yet when you simply live for Christ in obedience, taking dominion as a steward, walking in the truth in a worthy manner, you are taking ground in the spiritual battle for the cosmos. Hardly even realize it, right? But that's what the Scripture reveals and teaches repeatedly. And so listen, Christianity is antithetical to Gnostic dualism. The division of the flesh and the spirit, the secular sacred divide, is to be fought against in the church, and to do so, we have to be intentional. We have to speak clearly. We have to explain what we mean. We have to practice what we teach, and we have to fight off the efforts of those who know what they are doing and of those who are ignorant of what they are doing. And we have to work at loving those things that have the appearance to many of just being ordinary. We have to love the ordinary. Because in reality, there's nothing ordinary about it. They are profound and spiritual, and we need to love them for the sake of life in the body. Because what's happening in a lot of modern Christianity and, shall we say, even at Asbury University, it is the reaching for and the clamoring for something not ordinary, for something, something you can feel, something extra. And so every several years or decades, you try again with another revival. And where we left off was perhaps an unexpected place, and that was at the place of the Lord's table as a relevant discussion of the dangers of Gnostic dualism. That's what I had mentioned previously. And what I want to address is what we are doing when we partake of the ordinary elements of communion. And as we begin our discussion tonight, I want to start off with an apology. 
Because I definitely made it sound like Gnosticism had crept into the church's belief and practice of the Lord's table. And I have to admit that I had looked at it originally too superficially. I had attributed to some of the language of the Lord's table more of a Gnostic tendency that after more careful study, I I don't believe is truly there. I was a bit of a hammer looking for Gnostic nails, and I regrettably picked on the wrong nail. And so thankfully, I, I didn't drive it all the way in before I had the chance to be more careful. And so hopefully I can clean this up for us tonight and move on to biblical masculinity next week. So let's begin by looking at the London Baptist Confession once again, chapter 30, verse uh, number 7. If you have it with you, if not, you can just listen along. Chapter 30, number 7. Worthy receivers, outwardly partaking of the visible elements in this ordinance, do then also inwardly by faith, really and indeed, yet not carnally and corporally, but spiritually receive and feed upon Christ crucified and all the benefits of His death, the body and blood of Christ being then not corporally or carnally, but spiritually present to the faith of believers in that ordinance as the elements themselves are to their outward senses. Okay. Another way to say it is that the body and blood of Christ are not present bodily or physically. Okay, it's, it's, this, You've noticed in this particular um, statement, there really are, they really are addressing the errors of Roman Catholic uh, uh, Mass and their version of the Lord's Table. And so it's saying that the body and blood of Christ are not present uh, physically, bodily, but His body and blood are spiritually present to the faith of believers. Now what it sounds like, if we are not careful to explain, to define and to understand, is that it sounds like through the physical eating, just like Satan tempted Eve, that through physical eating she could access divine knowledge, it sounds like through physical eating we have access behind the elements to the spiritual body and blood of Christ as in a spiritual or as access to a spiritual or heavenly dimension. Now what I want to do is, is I want to examine some biblical texts, and I want to help us keep us in the center of God's meaning for us and the blessing that He has for us. And not to get off track in any way in the ditches that are on both sides. There are errors on both sides of this. But I think there is another one on the other side. Both of them, the Gnostic side and the other side, which I'll explain later, in my view, are in error that fails to properly treat the unity of flesh and spirit. But I am saying that the language of the confession reflects the teaching of Scripture, and I will explain that for us tonight. Again, originally it might sound like it's reaching for a spiritual experience in the Lord's table. And as I've studied more deeply and more seriously, I don't think that's what it's saying at all. And I'm wanting to make sure that we are just clear as to to what this is about. So let's get into the text. I was going to look at two texts, but there's really three texts I want to look at. The starting place is the supporting text for this statement about the spiritual presence of God, of, of the body and blood of Christ, to the faith of the believer who partakes of the physical elements of bread and wine. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'd say that this one is is probably the best and most profound at explaining this idea of the spiritual element of the Lord's table. And just before that, a quick aside. In terms of some of the debate of church history, it was really um, really Zwingli who fought against some of this idea of a spiritual, uh, spiritual presence of Christ. And it was all the debate over the words of of the Lord's table, where Jesus says, this is my body. So that's where a lot of the debate centers. But I think actually the better passage for understanding this, we'll we'll talk about that one as well, but the better passage for understanding this concept that I think is is truly here is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless 
a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Now, the second supporting text is simply the text we look at for the practice of communion. So go over to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 23 to 26. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Go ahead and flip back to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. This verse is in the middle of a paragraph. And the opening sentence of the paragraph tells you what the subject of the paragraph is. Okay, that's normal grammar. Verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. And so what Paul is discussing in this paragraph is the concern over what happens when you do things physically, when you do things in the world, or when you engage in religious rituals, you can't act like it doesn't have spiritual significance. Why? Because the things we do in the body are also spiritual. And that's what we've been saying, and, and then my aim is to say things that correspond to the teaching of Scripture. And so, and so Paul is saying that when you sacrifice to an idol, the idol we know is a dead nothing. It's a, it's a dumb piece of wood. So the idol isn't a thing. There is, though, actual spiritual service being done, Paul says. There is spiritual significance with reference to demons, and in verse 16, part of his explanation of this is the drinking of the cup and the eating of bread. So he uses the Lord's table as illustrating the spiritual significance of doing something physically for the purpose of religious service. Okay? There is spiritual significance. Paul calls it sharing. There is a spiritual participation in eating and drinking. And at the end of the chapter, he then says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Okay? There is, it matters your purpose and intention. And that statement comes after the paragraph in the middle where Paul says that eating meat that was once sacrificed to the idol, but is no longer part of the active ceremony of idolatry, the meat is just meat at that point. Because the idol itself is a dead nothing. Now you would not want to participate in the eating of meat or, or, or in the sacrifice that's when it's actually being done for the service of an idol. But after the meat has left the service of the idol, and it's in the marketplace... Paul is making the argument of, it's just meat. It formally was done in a ceremony for a particular religious purpose, but you can eat it without guilt, without, without participating in a spiritual sharing with demons at that point. But where does the significance of sharing in the blood of Christ and in the body of Christ come from? It comes from believers partaking in faith. It is, a, it is symbolic of a spiritual reality that Christ talked about, and, and I've highlighted repeatedly, and that is in John chapter 6. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus was speaking about faith, take, taking in Christ as life-giving food. And so when we partake of communion, we are expressing that our faith continues to share in the eternal life we received when we first ate of Him. Does that make sense? When we partake of communion, we are expressing that our faith continues to share in the eternal life 
that was purchased on the cross in the body of Christ when we first ate of Him in faith. It is an image of perseverance when we do so in faith. So think about this for a minute. And you'll have to, you'll have to rely on what you know to be true, not what you remember, because nobody remembers this event even though you were there in the flesh. But think with me about the day you were born. Again, you were there, but I doubt you remember, thankfully. Right? On the day you were born, almost immediately, did you eat? We're speaking normatively here, but of course. But you were placed near your mother's breast and you ate. Do you not continue to eat? The eating you do now continues to sustain you, and you eat now because you ate then. If you don't eat at the beginning, there is no life to eat later. The idea is that you, have, you, have, you must have taken Christ in by faith for your justification, but we continue to live by faith for our salvation in our sanctification. And so the, the Lord has given us an ordinance by, by means of His table where we continue to practice by faith a kind of eating. We eat of the Lord's table often because we continue to eat as a result of that first meal. We are sanctified because we are first justified. When we were born again and we ate and drank of Christ, He then has given us a symbol of this ongoing, persevering life of faith. And that life of faith is always to look to Christ. And so you believed in, in seemingly an ordinary fashion, but a spiritual credit was applied to us. Applied to you. And so when we partake of the Lord's table in faith as a believer, we are demonstrating a spiritual sharing in the death of Christ. That, that old song, right? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer is yes. And the eating and the drinking of bread and wine points to that spiritual reality. It points to the reality that when He died an ordinary death, of a Roman criminal, when he shed ordinary blood from a real physical human body, that ordinary physical death accomplished the greatest spiritual work of redemption ever conceived. And so what is the danger? Where is the Gnostic dualism? In thinking on it and in studying it more, I think I overstated, as I said, my original dualistic concern. I think it is possible, and it would be seen if you viewed the Lord's table as a mystical ceremony where you connect with or communicate with Christ in some out-of-body, extraordinary way. But that's actually not the great danger. And that's not what's being said or taught in the confession brought out from the teaching of Scripture. And so I just have to admit that I was wrong about how I thought about the Lord's table in terms of a dualism in the spiritual presence of Christ. And I'm actually very happy with the language of the confession as long as we understand that the forms, that is the, the, the bread and the wine, the visible elements, are not transformed in any way and that they are representative only. Because Zwingli is still correct is, this is my body, means this represents my body. They are symbols. But they are pointing to a spiritual truth, a spiritual reality, ordinary things reminding us of spiritual truth. But there's no dualism there as I first, as I said, perceived it. Actually, I think, listen, actually I think the greater danger, and what I'm wanting to avoid also, in the way I communicate. I think the greater danger is in flattening it out in order to be something only physical and that there is no sharing of Christ in the ordinary things. So let's continue. I want to bring this out a little bit further. 
Let's continue. I want to look at two other passages because I think they highlight the great Christian reality of our spiritual union with Christ. Because again, I want to remind us, He is present in all of His people here and now. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, a familiar text to many of us, it says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now often that's where the discussion of church discipline stops. We need to keep reading. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst." The next passage, would you turn over to Matthew 28? Another famous and important passage. Matthew 28, 18. It says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, We often, I don't know, in the explanation of this, we often stop right there. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And in this first passage in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is speaking about the role of church discipline and how it is affirmed in the courts of heaven. Did you catch that part? So let me explain. Jesus says that when you follow the process of discipline, dealing with sin, dealing with the purity of the church, and assumed here again is that you are judging with righteous judgment, then what you conclude in that process, what you decide to do as far as restoring or excommunicating, God affirms that decision. Meaning, it isn't just a physical thing about the physical church. God affirms it. And actually, the language is, it has already been affirmed. If a person is in sin before God and is guilty before the court of the church, and that person refuses to repent and and is excommunicated, if they remain in that unrepentant state, the conclusion of the church stands as valid in heaven, and that person will not be received with favor into glory with the rest of the church. That's a pretty important element. But also, if they repent and the church rightly receives them back, that also is recognized in heaven. Because the ordinary process of dealing with people in the church is spiritual and has heavenly implications. You see, church discipline isn't just us conducting business. Church discipline involves the business of heaven. Now when it comes to discipline, we have to be clear. If the church and its leaders are in sin and they throw someone out who is in fact not in rebellion towards God, Scripture affirms that God will find him and take him himself. A wonderful, beautiful example of this It's actually John 9, 34 to 38. We won't turn there now. John, but you can write it down, look it up later. It's a wonderful little story. At least that portion is is, uh, the tail end of it. And if you recall, it's where the man uh, who Jesus healed, he, he had been born blind. And so Jesus tells him to go to the synagogue. And he gives testimony to the synagogue officials about what had happened to him. And no one had ever heard of someone being born blind 
being healed. And so he gives testimony as to what happened to him. He didn't know who had healed him. He just was healed and said, okay, go to the synagogue. And after his testimony, they give him a real rough time. And what, do you recall what their conclusion was? They threw him out of the synagogue. They excommunicated him. You don't belong with us. You're an outsider. And the beauty of this passage is, it says Jesus found him. Because in that, if we're using the term church somewhat loosely, the synagogue, acting as the church, threw him out in error, in rejection of Christ. But it was Jesus who found him and revealed himself to this man. And so it is not, this is not a passage, Matthew 18, about the absolute perfect judgment of the church. That's not what it's about. But Jesus is pointing to something. He's pointing to the spiritual seriousness of the righteous judgments of the church. When matters of sin are confirmed by two or three witnesses, when you follow God's order and pattern, that you confirm a matter by the testimony of two or three witnesses, and when you properly decide something, the courts of heaven are impacted by that. Just like when Jesus died on the cross, the courts of heaven and the roles of justified sinners was affected by the death of a man with ordinary flesh and blood like you and me. But the kicker is verse 20. And that's where Jesus says that when you are gathered together for the execution of biblical justice, what does he say? I am there in the midst. And there's nothing mystical about it. But you also don't hear a lot of talking about church discipline and the value of having the presence of Jesus. You mostly hear it about the spiritual presence of Christ at the table. And I think, again, I think there's, there's a rightness to that, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that. But I'm pointing out here that Jesus explicitly says, my presence is with you. So it's not a, it, this is not a strange concept that Christ would be present among his people when we are engaged in ordinary things. So again, the big overarching picture that we're drawing here is the reality of the value of life in the body and ordinary things that everything that we do is spiritual. And Jesus is being very intentional saying that I want you to know that I am with you, present among you, when you're doing this business of discipline. When you're seeking to, to, when you're seeking to be wise and obedient in the purity of the church and dealing with sin, Heaven takes note, and I'm present among you. It is that what we do in life, what we do in the body as believers, we have the presence of Christ among us. And the, point, the greater point that Paul made, we looked at last week, is that doing things in the body is to have the Spirit of God present with you. For your body is the temple of God. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he tells us this to promote it in, a, in us a sense of the holiness that we are to have in everything we do. We are to be holy all the time. And in some things, he wants us to know this is especially important. So much so that I'm letting you know I'm present among you. We are to take our lives seriously. And we saw again last week that if you join your body in immorality with a prostitute, you have taken Christ in you by the Holy Spirit into that sin. That's Paul's point. It isn't dualism and it isn't secret knowledge or some wonderful feeling of spirituality. Jesus reveals it so it isn't secret and it is altogether ordinary while joined with spiritual presence, the spiritual presence of Christ. The ordinary things... Christ is present. So once again, think of the reality that you are a body and an eternal spirit in one. It's, it's mind-blowing. Now the second passage is, of course, the Great Commission. At the end, 
Jesus affirms that he is with us even to the end of the age. And so here is a second explicit statement that Christ is with us. But of course we recognize that he is not with us physically. Right? He ascended bodily into heaven and was seated bodily at the right hand of God, having then a glorified body. Christ is not with us physically. But he says that he will be with us to the end of the age. That's not saying waiting for the end of the age, that in our going and evangelizing and discipling, that he is with us like church discipline. We know that we have Christ with us, that is, all who believe in Him, in a spiritual sense. So that it is not physically present does not mean, though, that it is not real or powerful. And if, I don't know if you noticed the, the explanation in the confession, identifies that it, it, it's actually, it is real. Because you can't see it, and because you can't see Him, and because you can't feel the butterfly of the Holy Spirit flying around inside of you, doesn't mean it isn't real. And that's what Revelation is. Revelation tells you the reality of, uh, the truth of reality. The things that are really happening that you can't necessarily see with your physical eyes, but you trust with the eyes of faith. And he tells us this in his word. Why, Why does he tell us this? What difference does it make to know that Jesus is with you? What difference does it make to to know that Jesus is with you in evangelism? Think about it for a minute. What difference does it make to know that Jesus is with you in discipleship? He tells us this to remind us that the ordinary is also spiritual. He tells us this so that we know that He knows. He knows this conversation. He knows that person. He knows you. He tells us this so that we know that He is keeping us. He is keeping us safe. He is keeping us for Himself. That we are secure in Him. He tells us this so that we may know that He is empowering us. That He has given us a powerful message. And He's given us spiritual strength to deliver it. He tells us this so that we know that what we are doing for Him matters to Him. He tells us this so that we know that He is united with us. He tells us this so that we know He has loved us. Christ is always with His people. And when we honor and obey Him in the partaking of ordinary elements of bread and wine, He is, of course, present among us when we do so in faith. Because He told us to do it. Like He did with church discipline and like making disciples. It is a holy thing. And back to this idea of 1 Corinthians 10. That when you are engaged in spiritual service like this, You are engaged in the spiritual. Because when you do it, when you go and you sacrifice an animal to a stupid, dumb, dead piece of wood, the wood isn't affected, the sacrifice isn't affected, but something spiritual is affected. You have served demons. When you partake of the Lord's table, The bread isn't changed. The wine isn't changed. But when you do so in faith unto God, in obedience to Him, you've done a spiritual service unto Christ because He is among us. And He is in us. It is a spiritual service. And so therefore, it is a holy thing. And in so doing, we are to have confidence in Him and to grow in greater trust of Him as we we seek to understand and apply His death for us in a humbling manner. We are to then grow in greater faith as we partake. We are to be reminded of the basis for His dwelling among us in the first place, and that is His death. 
Because without his death, there is no dwelling of Christ among us, his people because his work of justification would not have happened. Ordinary bread and wine are pointing to the spiritual reality of Christ in his people. Why? Because when you got saved, you ate his flesh and drank his blood spiritually. You took him in and he gave you life. And so while being so very ordinary, it is profoundly spiritual. Again, it's uniting. That's where I messed up originally as I was working through it. It's the uniting of body and spirit, not the separation dualistically. So while being so very ordinary is profoundly spiritual, Christ is not distant from His people, but is ever-present. And in the Lord's table, the ordinary eating of the memorial elements points us to acknowledge that He is spiritually present with His people and that is very real, though not seen. It is not mystical, but it is real even though you don't feel it. And where I think we get off track and where I want to make sure that I'm not misunderstood, and that is in the flattening out of the ordinary into something that is not spiritual, I think that's probably more of our tendency today. As I reflected on how so many churches that I've been in have turned a very legitimate spiritual memorial into a flatly unspiritual and very ordinary thing, I think that we just miss an understanding, an element of understanding of the unity of body and spirit, the sacred and the ordinary. The way that the Lord's table is spoken of often and treated, it is not holy, it is not spiritual. Really, it's treated as if it's just physical and it's merely a reminder. It's just a ritual without recognizing a spiritually significant reality of service that is done and Christ's presence among His people. And the truth is, I think we miss out on the encouragement in evangelism and in church discipline and in the Lord's table and in everyday life, for that matter, when we forget to realize that Christ is present with all those who trust and obey Him by faith. Because the reality is, you take Christ with you every day. What's the line of the song? Waking or sleeping... Thy presence, my light, is that what it, how it goes, right? That the presence of Christ is with you, whether you are aware of it or not, whether you're awake or whether you're asleep, because Christ indwells His people and is present among us. And that's not mystical. But it is as real as you are a complex unity. It's as real as that you are a body and an eternal spirit in one. So too, we have been united inseparably with Christ. There is no spiritual zap or feeling of another world. Rather, it is the ordinary that is united with the spiritual. And we then are privileged to have the living Christ in our midst. He is among us now. And He is pictured as present when we eat and and eat the bread and drink the wine. For this is done before His sight. And so this doctrine is meant then to encourage us and to remind us of the call to holiness that that should bring. And so I want to wrap up our time then with this understanding. Now what is man? We are a complex unity of body and spirit made in the image of God. Made with a purpose to take dominion for God's sake, for His glory. As stewards of the creation order. We are not to dabble in spiritism, in divination, 
astrology, witchcraft, or any of these other elements of Satan that seek to give you a secret knowledge beyond that which God has revealed and given to us in ordinary revelation, not secret, in revelation, telling us the way things are truly, that Christ dwells among and in His people. And He is present among us, especially to bless when we take seriously the purity of the church, when we evangelize, when we gather around the Lord's table, we want to recognize and remember Christ is among us and in us all the time. And that is based on His death on the cross for His people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this time together. We thank You for Your Word. And we thank You for Christ who is ever-present with us. We deserve none of that. We recognize how special that is, yet it is revealed and open and available to be read and to be heard and to be understood. We pray that we would recognize the value and the significance of every day and every moment lived in the body as spiritual, as we participate in the spiritual warfare that you have called us to engage in. We pray that we would put on the armor of God, that we would stand firm. We pray that we would see the value of of every day, every ordinary thing, eating and drinking, going to work, washing the dishes, doing the laundry, all kinds of activities of enjoyment and leisure and all these different things. Lord, we, we pray that we would recognize that they are all relevant spiritually and they are done before Your face. And we pray also that we would take greater encouragement and joy in the reality of knowing that You are with us among Your people. And You have reminded us especially for spiritual endeavors of evangelism and discipleship, of the serious matters of dealing with unrepentant sin. And when we gather together on the Lord's Day to partake of the table of our Lord, we recognize the reminder You've given us of Your presence among Your people. We pray that we would not fall into error of mystical spiritualization on one hand or on the other hand of flattening it out to be something that is also ordinary and physical only in terms of no significant meaning of spiritual service. We pray that we would think rightly and live rightly before You. We pray that You would Receive honor and glory from us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.